uh, looking at the church at Laodicea. Uh, we'll be talking about that today, depending on how much you all want to participate. Uh, we may or may not begin chapter 4. Um, so, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Uh, <laughs> if you want to begin it, we can begin it. Anyway, um, we'll briefly recap Philadelphia, and then we'll, we'll talk about Laodicea and the applications thereof. So, but before we do that, we want to go to God in a word of prayer. And um, Chuck, if you'll up to doing opening prayer. Our God and our Father, how blessed we are to be here this morning. Thank you, Father, for watching over us through the evening hour and throughout all our lives. We know, Heavenly Father, that every good blessing comes from you. As we open your word this morning, Heavenly Father, we pray that we might open our minds and our hearts also. As we study the book of Revelation, we understand that sometimes it's hard to understand the things that are written, but we have a good teacher, Heavenly Father, we know in Britain. Heavenly Father, we once again thank you for all the many blessings of this life. Thank you for your son who died for us. Watch over us and keep us, we ask in his holy name. Amen. Thank you, Charlie. Okay. So, Philadelphia, just real quick, because we kind of, that was last week, we finished up Wednesday night, and we started Laodicea, and we're going to hopefully finish up Laodicea this morning, but let's recap um, what was talked about with uh, Philadelphia. So, uh, thinking back to Philadelphia, uh, what was the thing that Jesus committed them for? Well, what, what were they doing right? They did nothing right. Jesus condemned them right there on the spot and no second chance, right? Ron? They kept his word. So they were faithful to his word, right? Now, trick question. What was wrong with Philadelphia? Mumble louder, please. Nothing. Nothing. Right, it's one of the two churches in Revelation that Jesus does not have any specific sin to call into account. Philadelphia, I believe Smyrna, is the other one. So you have one good church in both sets of letters, okay? Um, easy way to think about that. Philadelphia, though they are small in power, they remain faithful to God's word, and because of that, Jesus is going to bless them by giving them a... a well, unparalleled opportunity for evangelism is what, they're, what Jesus is going to do for them. And we, we noticed how Philadelphia, the challenge, the, the, the thing that Philadelphia had to overcome is keeping a healthy church healthy. And we don't think, well, how is that a challenge? Well, it's, there's a lot of challenge in staying on the straight and narrow and keeping focus. One of my favorite quotes from the Bible uh, commentator Derek Kidner uh, and his commentary on Proverbs actually made this point. He said, a big part of righteousness is dogged attention to familiar truths. Um, and that is, we all know basic truth about what the Bible teaches. The, the kind of where the rubber meets the road is, are we willing to continue to pay attention and to heed and to live by the same truths that we are very familiar with? And that, I would say, epitomizes Philadelphia. They had to keep on the straight and narrow. So, Laodicea. Now, um, who remembers uh, maybe the unique geogra geographical feature or features about Laodicea? We talked about them. Russ? There were two different water sources that were nearby. One uh, was a hot spring and the other one was not. And uh, where the two converged, uh, it became a lukewarm, thus the lukewarm uh, notation that they had as far as their behavior <laughs> the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. Uh, what we see often in the, in the seven letters is that Jesus will take something that the city is known for and use that in either his condemnation or uh, commending of what they're doing. Laodicea then even 
today is known for its awful water. And that's because as Russ uh, reminded all of us that in first century times, there was a hot spring and there was a cool source of water and both sources had to be piped in. And by the time it got to the city, it was lukewarm and it was known for travelers who would try and drink the natural water would often end up spitting it out or vomiting it. Um, it's interesting, the Greek word that Jesus used here for um, uh, vomit or spew you out of my mouth, um, it's the Greek medical term for induced vomiting. Like we would use Ipecac today for, well, hopefully some of you were, no, I know most of you should know about Ipecac. Anyway, you ingest something that's not good for you, you have to induce vomiting because if it keeps inside you, it's going to do more damage than what the vomiting is going to do. Think about that imagery then with Jesus saying this about this church. It is more dangerous to the whole body of Christ to keep them in if they are unrepentant than to get rid of them. Now let's, before I, I'm jumping ahead here, let's reread the letter, starting in verse 14 of Revelation chapter 3. And I'm reading from the Legacy Standard Version of your Bibles, and it says as follows. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, This is what the Amen, faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says. I know your deeds, that you're neither hot, sorry, you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot, but so because you are lukewarm, you're neither hot nor cold. I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and I have become wealthy and have need of nothing, you do not know that you are wretched and pitiable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so you may become rich, and white garments so you may clothe yourselves, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be manifested. And I solve that to anoint your eyes so you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and he will dine with me and me, and will dine with me and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So from the last time, we'll remember that Jesus is described here as the Amen, the faithful uh, and true one. And this is just to underscore the fact that what J Jesus has the right, true perception of all things. And as Brother Haley pointed out, because he is the Amen, he is the faithful and just one, he is alone the rightful critic of the church. And if he is the rightful critic of the church, anything he says should be and needs to be heeded. Because we see Laodicea's condition, you can probably see how some of them, if they got this letter, would say, why do I need to listen to that? That's, not, that's an inaccurate, that, that's, that's fake news. We're not like that. No, Jesus said you are. And you probably need to pay attention to that. Um, real quick before we talk about Laodicea's main issue, there's a bonus question here, and I, I think it's a good opportunity uh, to underscore the value of Bible study tools. What do we make of the end of verse 14, where a part of Jesus' description is the beginning of the creation of God. How do we understand that? Uh, but some of our religious friends will pounce on that verse to teach very heretical, uh, disrespectful uh, things about our Lord Christ. So let's maybe start with some known truths, okay? Someone want to remind us to effect, paraphrase John 1, 1 and, you know, the first couple of verses there. What, what does John, the Gospel of John chapter 1, reveal to us about Jesus? He's creator. He's creator. Chris, you had something? Yes. Okay, so he's creator. What else does John tell us? Nancy? Sorry, I was thinking of Colossians 1.15. Which reads? Which reads, um, 
He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. And it goes on. So Colossians and John, these are not the only places, but affirm that Christ is the creative agent or the member of the Godhead that brings things into existence. Okay? What else does John 1 have to tell us about Jesus? Brett? The word is with God, so there's two distinct persons, then the word was God. So, as we just kind of recap, John 1 affirms Jesus is eternal, existed co-equal with the Father in the beginning. It also affirms that he is the creative agent by which God the Father wills. Jesus is that which brings it into existence if you follow the, the breakdown more or less. So, going back to this verse in Revelation. Some teach that this means, it says the beginning of the creation of God, that means Jesus is a created being. How would we answer that? Paul? Going back to Genesis chapter 1, this idea of the beginning of the creation of God. How does the creation start? It says, and God said. Jesus is the word. It's the beginning of the creation of God. Okay. So, as Paul pointed out there, Jesus is the word. God said in Genesis 1. That's the beginning or the start of the creation of God. Steve? It's in John chapter 1, first three verses. It makes it clear that, that, that Jesus existed with God before the creation. Right. Um, he, Jesus, from our scriptures, we can, we can see that Jesus existed with God from the beginning. Now, I'm going to point something out here. This, I'm going to underscore the value of having different Bible translations in your library or access to them, <coughs> whether print or online. My preference, I would say it's worth your money to purchase three or four translations that are reputable, but also that have different translation philosophies. Um, because through a thought for thought, a word for word, and a, even a paraphrase sometimes, you'll get to the whole hue of what the original text was saying. And you don't need to know a lick of Greek to do that. You have three or four good translations, um, you'll be able to do that. So a word for word, which is a little bit misnomer in that category, is your New King James, King James, Legacy Standard, New American Standard, ESV, um, thought for thought, NIV, pre, uh, the 2011's good, and the original 1979's good. Uh, they had a weird hiccup in the early 2000's, and they corrected it. But uh, that's a good thought for thought. It's a very readable translation. Uh, Christian Standard Bible is in that same category. And as a paraphrase, paraphrase, mind you, is not a translation, but persons attempt to rephrase the text in a way that's understandable. These are helpful because sometimes they phrase things in a different light than what we're used to thinking, and it can help us in our Bible study. Uh, New Living Translation would fall in that, in that category. Why am I saying all this? Because if you were to flip through your different Bibles on this verse, this is what I do when I come to a passage like, well, that, that seems to say one thing, but I, I don't think it actually means that. First stop is let's read different translations. So if you have the Revised Standard, the New Revised Standard, you would read in Revelation 3.14, that it reads as the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. Oh, okay. If you had the Christian Standard Bible or the Holman Christian Standard Bible, you would read, thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. And if you felt like doing Greek studies and all that stuff, and maybe you opened vines or your monts or whatever, you would look up the word here in Revelation, which is arche, means beginning and ruler. Well, you're like, well, that's kind of weird. How's a beginning and ruler? Um, because in the original use of Greek, the understanding was, well, in the beginning, there was a ruler who established order, and that's how we live by that order, whether that's a king or a deity, whatever it is. So we take that word and we realize what the Bible teaches, Genesis 1, John 1, well, Jesus is ruler God. 
In the beginning, he did establish the law and everything that the universe is governed by. But you don't even need to know that Greek stuff, right? We, we showed if you just go to different translations, you can kind of get a sense of what it's saying there. Now, I only say this because um, last year I had a study with some Jehovah's Witnesses, and they will go to this verse and say, see, Jesus is a created being. He's not God. And that's, many cults will claim that. Um, many of our religious friends today will even say, well, I believe he was a good teacher, but he's not God. And they might even go to this verse. And so it's helpful for us in this little excursion to maybe have some tools and know how to reason from this and say, well, no, this is not saying what you think it says. Uh, any questions or comments here? Oh, Russ and Bright. I'm a little bit simple. Mm -hmm. John 1.1, 1, 1, I'll put it. In the beginning was the word word was with God, the word was God. Right. Period. Right. And that illustrates a point, too, from what the psalmist says in Psalm 119, that the sum of thy word is truth. So when we come to a, a verse that seems to be contradicting in their verse, we have to figure out a way to reason through it. And we know that God speaks with perfect harmony in his scripture. That's one of the presuppositions we work from. And we know John 1 says that, so we have to understand Revelation 3.14 in a different way then. So, right? Yes. Uh, I think uh, the Amen also kind of uh, summarizes um, everything that is being explained by the end of the verse 14. Because when we look at the meaning of a Amen, which is to say, uh, let it be, mm -hmm. or let it be so, uh, then we understand that uh, when we compare it to the creation story, then it means that he is the reason why the things were so he was the make happen. Without Jesus, those things were not going to happen. So uh, that is my understanding of the use of the amen uh, to describe Jesus Christ. That's a really good point. I'm, uh, I want to repeat it for everybody. So our brother Bright brings up the point that and we, we've talked about this last Sunday uh, from 1 Corinthians when we talked about how shall the ungifted say the amen. We talked about what amen means. It means let it be so. And so Jesus is being described as the amen means that he is the one that makes it so. He is the guy that makes it happen. Um, and so if you're the guy that makes it happen, and I'm going to use some bad English here, you can't be the guy that it happened to, right? Um, you are the guy in charge. You're the one who sets everything in motion. So, Andy? Yes, yes, I'm, yes, I'm, 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 I
And part of that is we might infer from some of the things that are said that you think you are rich and all that kind of stuff that Laodicea might be a congregation that is really wealthy. And wealth is not inherently sinful, but you read Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, 1 Timothy 6, wealth requires attention and intentionality and stewardship. And you have to be on top of it and control it, otherwise it will control you. It's a tool, and it's an amplifier. Money will just make you more of what you already are. So if you're greedy, it's just going to make you more greedy. If you're generous, it's going to make you more generous. It's simply a tool and an amplifier for what you already are internally. And so for this congregation, it seems that, and this, by the way, is not a first century thing. You could look at the history, religious history of the United States or other, where, other places. When religious groups come into a lot of money, there is a tendency to become complacent. Because we see, and mankind has seen this since money was invented, a lot of money is security, is safety, which then can lull you into a false sense of security and a false sense of self-sufficiency. Uh, because Jesus points out here that their big issue is the fact that they, they think they're rich, they think they're in good standing. Um, but he says that you're wretched and pitiable and poor and blind and naked. It's kind of think of um, the emperor's new clothes. That old fairy tale I think is really applicable for Sardis. Um, so thinking about applications for today, you know, what might, you know, Sardis' issue of being self-deceived and thinking they're self-sufficient, are there ways that we can deceive ourselves as a congregation? And there, are there ways that we, can, that we think we might be self-sufficient? Andy? I would say, yes, it's, 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 it's actually, I mean, that, that, that's not a tricky thing because it's too easy for someone to deceive themselves and, and think, oh, they're doing great, even though they're, even, even though they're doing really poorly. Okay. Uh, and he says that it can be easy to convince ourselves we're doing the right thing, even though we may not be doing that. Uh, we're going to talk about solutions, by the way. I just want to talk about problems right now. So, Paul? So verse 15, right? He starts this whole critique of them off with the same words that he's used for all of the other churches. Right? He says, I know you are their, their zeal or lack thereof can be seen by their works or lack thereof. <clears throat> there, there's nothing separating them from the people around them. So, what Brother Paul points out that rightfully so in the beginning of this letter is I know your deeds and then here's the effect of your deeds. And by the fact that he tells them to be zealous and repent, buy from me all this stuff that you may be truly wealthy, we might infer rightly that this is a congregation who has lost its zeal and is not really involved at all. So how does that look like practically? You know, what might a congregation look like that has lost its zeal and is not involved and is not, well, carrying out the things of the gospel? Rob? Okay. What might that look like? I know I'm just going to ask the same question over and over again, but... Um, you're doing the same thing over and over again, but you're not, you're not growing. You're not, you're not doing it like you said with the zeal, with the love for God. It's I'm here. I'm punching my time clock. I'm on the surface looking like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, but my heart and soul is not in it. Your body's there, but your mind's checked out, right? <clears throat> Which scary thing. Maybe you just. Hopefully you don't. There's been times where we get. For example, we're so used to driving. There's been times I leave here at the building and I get home like, how did I get here? Uh, maybe that says more about me and I shouldn't have said that to my insurance agent. But anyway, uh, we can do that with our service to God. We show up, we punch the clock. Anyway, I'm talking too much. Chris and Paco. Yes, in, a, in a way, then maybe how you could physically see it is the uh, lack of attendance, you know, uh, the complacency in the... In the in the servitude of the, of, of the church, uh, you, you see that there's 
not growing by not having gospel meetings, uh, a church, uh, a congregation not having Bible study, that, that, that there are churches out there like that. But that's just kind of what, what I was thinking. Okay, so one symptom of, of a congregation like this might be you might see it in just the life of the assembly, right? Not a lot of participation, people don't show up, whatever it may be. Um, you can see people's interest by what they do and do not participate in. Paco? Um, the, through the repetition of words, it's not really wrong with saying phrases that you're comfortable with when praying or, or talking about. But when you're saying them without meaning, without thinking about them, and just repeating them over and over and over again, and I was a Catholic, I would repeat the same prayer without really thinking about it. I said, got to get through the prayer, now I'm done. Mm -hmm. That's not how we should be doing our prayers in front of the congregation, thinking about what you're saying. Because it could, it could be really easy to think, oh, he's just, the prayer, that's good, it's a good prayer. But if you're not thinking about the prayer and God and Jesus, and it's like, yeah. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's the point we talked about last Sunday morning, right? Um, when Paul, in 1 Corinthians 14, talks about uh, praying with the understanding and the heart, right? Both need to be engaged. And one way we can sometimes become self-sufficient and complacent is we just repeat what we've always heard without any thought, without any contemplation. Uh, Paul. In to, to follow on with Chris's comment about involvement, right? Um, does the congregation, here, here, here's, here's a sign, right? Does the congregation see this, what we do here, as the extent of our activity as a congregation? Because Jesus says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. How much of your time does he have? Yeah, so you, you look at your time involvement. Um, I'm going to call on just two more people on this problem thing because we need to start talking about solutions. So I think it was Ron and then Russ. Ron? You know that scripture that says there's a way that seems right to man, and that the way leads to death? You know, congregations can make changes in God's word mm -hmm. and, and grow to think that that's a, the proper way to do things or interpret things. <clears throat> Rear off the straight and narrow path, I guess. Okay, so the standard uh, becomes whatever we want it to be. Yeah. Russ? From my point of view, and this is strictly my point of view, if I hear that someone needs the prayers of this congregation on Sunday morning, and I come back the next Sunday morning and I hear the same thing, but I haven't done anything about it, I might be lukewarm. Mm. Very good point. Now, we've talked about various issues, some of solutions. So Laodicea, their issue was they're self-deceived, uh, the emperor's new clothes basically in a congregation. Jesus said for them um, in verse 18, in Revelation chapter 3, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become uh, rich, white garments that you may clothe yourself and that your shame of your nakedness may not be manifested and I solve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Um, those whom I love I reprove and discipline therefore be zealous and repent. So Jesus depicts them in verse 17 wretched, pitiable, poor, and blind and naked. He admonishes them I'm the source of all your needs. I will clothe you rightly, I will heal you, I will make you proper, I will cover up the shame of your nakedness. Okay, so let's not get lost in the, well, what is the eye salve and what is the garment? The point is, Jesus is the source of their spiritual sufficiency, not themselves. So they were told, be zealous and repent. So thinking about some of the things, the problems we've talked about this morning, what are solutions to some of the problems? Okay. So our brother Paco was very kind and he gave the problem and the solution, right? The problem is just checking out your mind and not, not thinking about what you're saying. Well, what's the solution? Being intentional and thoughtful in your prayers and what you say at the table and just don't go on the script. Um, Nancy? When, when it comes to the congregation, if we see a problem that we could help with, step up 
and do it rather than assuming someone else will. Right. And that's a really, really good point. I'm going to repeat it. If we see a problem, and if it's within our ability and opportunity to fix that problem, the responsibility is on me. Don't assume somebody else is going to do it. This, here's what happens when everyone assumes the problem will get taken care of. It never gets taken care of. And, you know, there's... Growing up, my dad would chastise us kids because we would walk by a mess or see something, and he would see us see it, and he would say, well, why aren't you doing anything about it? It might be the trash. That was my chore. Um, and there was no good answer, right? I knew it was my responsibility. I saw it was full and oftentimes over full. Um, I should have just done it, right? And oftentimes in the congregation, we see a problem, we see a need or whatever, and we excuse ourselves. We see somebody else will take care of it. And the thing is, if that happens all the time, nothing ever will get done. Steve, then Paco. The Bible teaches us that we're supposed to stir up in one another a wish, a will for doing good works. The way to, there's two ways to do that. The first way is to do good works and be an example. The second way is when you need help, you communicate that because, and, and I'll be honest, that's probably a, a fault of most congregations today because they feel like, well, there's other people that have bigger problems than me, so I shouldn't mention it. If you want to other people to do good things and you're not willing to call for help, <coughs> they're not going to get the reinforcement of helping somebody nearby with something simple that they can do, that they can see that they're walking the path that God wants them to walk, you're not giving them the opportunity to grow because you're not willing to let people see that you need help. Well, guess what? We all need help. Mm -hmm. And so if we're not willing to do that, we're at fault as much as those that, that will, won't do when, when the call is made to everyone to help. We should, we should reinforce with one another, both by the doing and also by calling for help when we need it, so that we build up the idea and it becomes normal to us that when somebody says, I need help wherever they are, or the call goes out, you're, all, you're already halfway to standing up with your arm raised, saying, here I am. Right, and the, the verse you reference is Hebrews 10, uh, 24 through 20, well, 24, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And, and to your point, Steve, um, we oftentimes think about the act of doing, serving, that kind of stuff, but also we need to be willing to receive good works. There's nothing wrong with receiving good works. And sometimes we are, we are the rightful recipient of that. There's also nothing wrong, and in fact, it was I would encourage all of us that if we are going to go perform a good deed or something, take somebody along. I won't ask for hand raises, but you know, how many of you, you can nod your head or not, was asked to hold the flashlight for your dad growing up? You can nod your head. Um, and I know for me, it's just, you're holding it, and it's like, you can't hold it right, because no matter how you hold it, it anyway. Dad didn't need you to hold the flashlight, or maybe he did. Dad didn't need you to help him fix the car or whatever. In fact, you probably, I got in the way most of the time. Here's what dad was doing. He was showing you how to do things, even if it was at this very basic level. I'm going out visiting, for example. So let's take that. Do I need one or two other brothers or sisters to go with me? No, you don't need them to do it. Is it beneficial for you and the brother or sister you're visiting and for them? Absolutely. There's a reason why Jesus on the limited commission sent the disciples out two by two, not one by one. Because it's easier to do things in Paris, but also if you're more experienced, you can take somebody who's less experienced along and they can start seeing how it's done and they build the confidence to where they can go out and do it. Now, my dad was not a handyman. That didn't stop him from trying. And, you know, that taught me a few things. One, why not take a stab at it? 
because, well, maybe I'm too optimistic. I don't think I can make the problem any more worse and the, the repairman's not going to charge me anymore. I haven't tested that theory and I don't want to test that theory. Um, but, you know, take a stab at it, right? Go visiting. Go take somebody a meal. Now, they might throw it away because you can't cook, and you know, it's probably me, but, you know, try it, right? Do something. Uh, because congregations wither and die when everybody sits on their hands. And God's not asking us for perfection or stellar performance. He's asking for the right heart and the right motive. So one last illustration on this. There was a lady who um, was going to this woman's conference, and the woman who was teaching at it was renowned for her amazing hospitality. Like, and so this woman had all these ideas of what that hospitality was going to be like, probably a formal sit-down dinner, all this kind of stuff. And after the conference, she says, why don't you come over to my house? And we're, we're going to be talking some more and everything. And so she shows up, and here is her hospitality. And I'm, none of this is a critique. I'm going to show you how easy it can be. There's laundry all over the couch. Last night's dinner still, like, pans are still in the kitchen sink, and she's pulling out leftover pizza, and they're just sitting at the table talking and enjoying each other. And this lady was renowned for her hospitality, and she realized, this other woman, that it's not the glamour or glitz you put it on with, it's the service. It doesn't have to be fancy, it doesn't have to be special. It just has to be done. Um, because I can remember a lot of times being over at Brethren's houses, talking with each other, and enjoying each other's company. I don't think I can remember a single meal that we shared. And I can't remember if the living room was clean or not, or there was last night's dishes in the sink. I do remember the conversations and the time spent with the brethren. And those of you who visit are going to remember the same thing. Uh, so Laodicea, going back to the text here, I appreciate the, the participation this morning. So their, their solution is they have to dethrone themselves as being the, thinking they can be self-sufficient and get back to he who gives the sufficiency, and that's Jesus. And in many of the churches we see this is the solution. In their fault, in their sin, they've, they've gone away from the source. So they need to go back to the source. And oftentimes, in times of trials and tribulations and stress, we drift away from the source. Think back to Hebrews chapter 2 when we studied Hebrews um, a couple of months ago. Um, See to it that you pay attention, and this is my paraphrase, to whom who has saved you, so that you may not drift away from the truth. That term there, drifting in Hebrews, is a nautical term for somebody being slightly off course. You don't notice it at first until you get several miles down the road and you realize, oh, I am way off course now. And so it takes diligence. Um, Laodicea here, um, he reminds them, and, and for us, at the end of the letter, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and will dine with him and he with me. Now, I think this is a reminder for both Laodicea and for us. Jesus is always willing, ready, and able to accept us back, to include us, to have fellowship with us. But notice the illustration. He's the one knocking. Are we willing to open? And the opening is various things. Opening could be repentance. Opening could be the service. Opening could be becoming a Christian for the first time or being renewed to the faith. Opening could be any number of things in which we are doing in order to get Christ more in our lives. And that picture there is that of blessed fellowship, of, of dining at the same table as Christ there. Um, so he says in 21 22, He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me at my, father's, uh, at my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. He who was an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So again, this picture of fellowship and, 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 and glory is, is continued in verse 21, that if we overcome, we in a similar fashion as Jesus ascended into heaven, sat down at the right hand of the Father, so we will have that same expectation of sitting down with Christ. Now what's interesting is, I think we get a, a broader picture now of what it means to overcome. Because it says, as I overcame and sat down 
by my father on his throne. What are some things Jesus overcame before he, oh, as, after, what did he overcome and then ascended, you know? And this is, this is a broad category, so just, if you have something, just start throwing it out there. Betrayal. Okay, betrayal, Nancy? Prejudice. Prejudice. I'll throw death out since we have like five minutes left. Death. Family. Sin. Sin. Temptation. Temptation. Aloneness. Aloneness. There in the garden. Everything we could deal with. Everything we could deal with. And so that broadens this phrase that we've been reading in these seven letters. He who overcomes. Each church, yes, has a specific thing they had to overcome. But here at the close of the seventh letter of to the seven churches, we get that little phrase and we see to overcome is simply to make it through this life still being faithful to God. And the reward for all that, again, we're about ready to see a glimpse of that in chapter four and five, is eternal fellowship and bliss with God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit for eternity in heaven, where all wrongs will be righted and all pains will be alleviated Everything we've been promised. So, we're not quite done. I do want to just... We've been in the seven churches for a little bit, but I, I tried to summarize the, the big lesson from each of the seven, because as we noted at the beginning of this study of the seven churches, um, the fact that seven indicates perfection, that while these are seven letters to seven specific churches, they can also be read as one letter to the church for all time. It's a completed revelation. And so we start off, we start off at um, Ephesus. So by way of review, uh, I think the big lesson we learned from Ephesus is that we need to be zealous, but don't neglect love. That was their issue. They were good in deed and doctrine, but they had left their first love. And we, we noted on how their pursuit of orthodoxy probably had killed gentleness and brotherly affection. And so their solution was they have to go back to the deeds they did at first and rediscover that brotherly love. So that's the lesson from us, is be zealous, but don't forget love. That next church we studied was Smyrna. Um, they were doing good, but they were about ready to undergo some intense persecution. And so that letter reminds them, don't worry, God is in control. You will, some of you are going to be thrown in prison, but guess what? It's going to be for a limited time. I've told you the end of your persecution because I'm the one in control of all things. And so we have to remind ourselves of that as well. And God is always in control. Um, thirdly, we looked at Pergamum. Pergamum was the first church we looked at that had issues with false teaching. And so the lesson we learned from there is we have to hold fast to all of what God has commanded. They were, ex they were growing, and in fact, they, their deeds were greater then than they were at first, but again, they were tolerating some pretty dangerous teachings. And so they weren't holding fast to everything God had said. Thyatira, um, again, another church that was dealing with false doctrine, but they need to, they need to serve and love, but don't neglect doctrine, because again, uh, they're dealing with some pretty dangerous teaching. Um, and so we have those two churches back to back, which reminds us that no matter what period of life we're in, no matter what stage a congregation would be in, it needs to be grounded and centered on what the words of God say. Any departure from that will lead to issues. And a time of cultural upheaval, a time of persecution, is not the time to neglect what the word says. In fact, the opposite. Um, and in fact, if you look at trends now in the greater religious world, um, what's on the ascendancy right now is expository preaching. And what is expository preaching? It is, we're dealing with the chapter. We're going to read the chapter. We're going to explain the chapter. We're going to apply the chapter or the text, whatever it is. We would call it scriptural. Working through the text and the and many denominations, what they call preaching is what we do for Bible class, actually, is working sequentially through a text and expounding upon it. That tells me something. The fact that that's trending right now, and for the last 10 years, the religious groups have been going that direction, 
It tells me religious folks in America have a hunger for the word of God that is not being met at the places where they're worshiping. That people want good, solid Bible teaching. Now think of the larger culture. We're abandoning all biblical morality. People in certain aspects of our culture really cannot stand Christians. It's getting more and more hostile. There's a doubling down on what the Word of God says. And that's the correct response, right? And I pray that the doubling down on expository preaching will lead more and more people to the truth because they'll be seeing things in context the way God designed it to be. Anyway, Brendan Rant, over. Sardis, they need to remember to have faith and works. And that's for us too. We, this is the message of James. We cannot have one or the other. Uh, Philadelphia, continue on the path. That's always the right choice to do if you're on the right path is keep on keeping on. And as we just talked about Laodicea, seek the sufficiency in Christ. Seek your sufficiency in Christ. Um, I will upload this slide to the website. Um, I'll leave it up for just a little bit. I do have to switch over to my PowerPoint for the sermon. But those are the seven letters. So preview of coming attractions, the study guide for Revelation 4 and 5 is in the lobby. We're going to be dealing with that as a unit because it is one vision. And so we're going to be talking about that. So, uh, Ron, last comment. I wonder what he'd say about us. <laughs> Ron, that's a very good application question. I'm going to repeat it. So all, we can, all of us can chew on it. Ron said, I wonder what God would say about us here at 10th and Country Club. So, something for you to chew on this week. Wednesday night, Lord willing, we'll be in Revelation chapter 4. Thank you for your participation this morning.